So here's the knowledge. Revelation 2nd chapter 2. I know your deeds. He's looking at you today. Look at me. He's looking at you today. He knows your deeds. So, so what's in your heart today? What's in that brain of yours you're thinking about? I'm thinking about lunch a little bit. I'm kind of hungry. Is that what's in your brain today? Are you being So he knows your deeds. He knows your thoughts. He knows your hard work. He knows your perseverance. And he knows it, it says. Christ says, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men. That you have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and found them to be false. You know what apostles are? Again, they're, they're messengers. They're coming as representatives of someone who sent them with full authority to speak on their behalf. Now, there was an apostolic period. There's a debate whether that continued on. You won't care about it. I do. I love this stuff. If an apostle, you know, apostles could do miracles. Did you know false apostles could too? So there's a hard way to decide between the two. So there are apostles doing miracles and there are false apostles doing miracles at the same time. And this church was said to be aware of that and that they persevered in verse 3 and endured many hardships. Why yeah. not? Grown tired. Are you tired? Are you tired or weary? That's, a, that's amazing. They stuck with it. So Christ tells the church that he knows of all of this. And they were in an area bound in all sins of all kinds. Do you, do you think we are in an area with sins of all kinds? Bad things happening? Yes, we really are. Ephesian Christians did not lack a seriousness, and they did sustain commitment even to a point of suffering. They had good deeds, hard work, and perseverance, and had not grown tired. Good doctrine guided this Ephesian church, and they could not tolerate wicked men. I'll bet you good doctrine is taught here. You know what doctrine is? It's it's, it's what you believe. It's what the Word tells you and what you believe about that, about the church, about Christ, about mankind. That's called doctrine. What do you believe what man is like? What do you believe about the church, about leadership? And the wicked men were not pagans of the city, but they were false brethren who claimed to be apostles and were not. We're not sure as to the test who used what to determine that these persons were false or even what they were taught. But the church was able to determine who and what and were not authentic. The saints at Ephesus had come over all of this. They hated all that was evil and could not tolerate wicked men. They even tested false apostles who came to the church with a doctrine other than what Paul had taught them. Now, my question always is, when I go to churches, would Christ tell us the same thing that he told Ephesus? Do we hate sin that's in our world today? Do we not tolerate wicked men? Are we standing up against the pressures of the world? Are we just sitting back and letting it happen? Christ commended this church at Ephesus for their hard work against the wicked and also for their toil to the point of exhaustion for their service to Christ. Are we working hard trying to really reach people to bring them into the fold of this church? Do we know the Word of God well enough to touch someone's teaching that they may come into our church? You know, I've heard more, and I've shared this with you before, more heresy from teaching in churches. They take a passage of Scripture and don't have a clue about what they are talking about. And sometimes heresy is preached. I heard something the other day, and I was sitting in the church, and I heard the, the pastor preaching on a particular current topic. He was terrible. <laughs> he was not right. His scripture and doctrine were wrong. He was trying to make it fit into a common new society trend. So we all can fit in. And simply the scripture wouldn't allow for that. And so we need to be careful of what is being taught in our churches. It must be according to God's word. So sometimes Christians are being deceived by false doctrines. We need to be knowledgeable and we need to apply it to our lives and know when someone is not teaching the truth. Finally, the verdict and the command. Now, you remember, everything's good. They worked hard. 
All the people are good. They're coming together. They've stayed through tough times. Now, here's the next stage in verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. And remember three words in this next verse. Remember, repent, and do. Verse 5. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and I will remove this last stand from this place. So those are key words in this passage. Remember. What are we remembering? We're remembering, and I want you to hear this, that Christ is here today. I'm kind of reading into this now. It's called eisegetical teaching. Remember Christ. He's come into your house. You're not here to worship me. You're not here to worship one another. You're in a holy sanctuary, worshiping a holy God, and we're not here for societal trends or our cosmopolitan thinking or get everything to fit in. We're here to worship God. So remember, and remembering that, we're to repent. And that's a simply a, uh, an eschatological phrase or a church ecclesiastical phrase, meaning to change. We're to change, and finally, not just change, but do something with that. Paul had visited Ephesus about 40 years before the book of Revelation was written, and had stayed there about three years. During his ministry, a revival broke out. Their love for the Lord was reawakened. Their hearts were right in the right place, and they praised and worshipped God with all of their heart. Their love for Christ was greater than their love for anything else. Do you remember when you first knew Christ in your life and how much that so constantly affected your life and you wanted to talk about that with others? Is it still that way or is it like it happened to the church in Ephesus? When Christ dictated the letter of Ephesus to John and when Christ influenced his letter to John, it was almost 40 years after Paul had left Ephesus. This means that the people had 40 years to fall into Hear this, a theological routine. I want to say that again. We have fallen into a theological routine. They were like many churches today. Outwardly, we see good deeds and the religious traditions, but inwardly, they may be empty. Christians go through the motions. We get food for the food closets. We sign petitions against something in our town. We attend church every Sunday morning. Because we feel it's expected. We also uh, go and attend and practice and teach and preach. But where is the depth of it all, the love of it all? And I use that term carefully. Love doesn't mean that sweet little amorous thing we're talking about. It means that deep caring for one another. The book of Ephesians, Paul commends him not only for their love for Christ, but also for their love for each other. Paul wrote the letter to the church of Ephesians. This is a response now 40 years later in Revelation. If we still had our first love, full love, there wouldn't be any difficulties that all churches seem to have. If we still have our first love, we would be fully lifting one another up. If we still had our first love, we would be praising and worshiping God with a joyful noise instead of just a ritual of religious traditions. Do you think God just cares about what order we have in our worship services? Do you think about what He cares about what we wear in the church? I don't think so. What He does care about is what's in your heart. No amount of orthodoxy can be a substitute for the love and care you have for one another. And do you really love and care for one another intensely and with quality that gets you beyond any disagreements. We're going to disagree. But do you have something to carry you beyond that? That's deep in your heart. Are you following God's call in your life? Without love and care for one another, any church will not grow. Without love of new members, they're not going to re remain in the church. Without love in our church, we could lose our position as light bearers. This church is a lampstand. A lampstand is indicative of life. So, in these passages we've heard, remember who Christ is. 
He's ahead of your church, folks. Change. It's called repent. And then do something about it. 